All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are recording, so I'm going to go ahead and project this around the room. Um, all right, so a few announcements. I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that your problem set number two, part one and two, are in the back here. They are in alphabetical order, so if you want to pick them up on your way out, that would be great. I will post the answer keys today, right after class, for problem set number one and problem set number two. So I want this weekend, one of your, I guess, homework assignments or tasks would be to compare the answer key with what you got, okay? I want to make sure that you know exactly where you went wrong on some of those uh, questions. I will stay after today. Um, if someone's still struggling with which way an ion is moving, I'll just go to the board. You can kind of gather around in that area over there, and I will go through any questions that you have so far about the problem set, if you can stay. Otherwise, you can always make an appointment with me uh, during my office hours, okay? So I just want to make sure at this point you should, be, uh, you should feel really good about problem set number one and number two at this point. You should have mastered those concepts. Okay, any questions about that? Again, you can stay after class and we can, I can answer all your questions then as well. All right, so uh, today uh, when we get to the section, Meghna and I are going to pass out another case study on cystic fibrosis today. And uh, the case study is actually just one page back in the front and back, but the questions are a completely different uh, a completely different form, okay? And you only have to turn in the question sheet. You don't have to turn in the case study that just kind of rolls out the case, okay? Um, so we'll pass that out when we get to our section on cystic fibrosis today. All right, so let's go ahead and get started where we left off. Are there any questions right now about where we're going? Today we're going to finish up with facilitated diffusion and we'll start with active transport. All right, so here's where we left off last time. Just want to make sure that everyone remembers this particular animation. You can actually just, um, just uh, copy and paste the link if you'd like. But uh, what we were talking about last time is basically the three different gating properties, the states associated with the voltage-gated sodium channel. So these are channel gating during an action potential. We focused on the voltage-gated sodium channel. And you'll notice when there's a slight change in the membrane voltage, here's the three different states. This is the activation gate. It activates, inactivates, and then recovers from inactivation and goes back to the closed state. So this right here, this M gate, is the activation gate. This is the inactivation gate, okay? So I'll wait for it to go on one more loop just so everyone is clear. Now it's in its closed, oh, wait, hold on, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so now it's gonna recover from inactivation. I'm sorry. I'm messing you up, hold on just a second. Now it's closed, right? This is the closed state. Now it goes from closed to open, that's called activation, inactivation, that's when this H gate closes, and then it recovers from inactivation. Okay, pretty good. Anybody have any questions about that? So what you need to know is the terminology. You need to know the three different states, closed, open, and inactivated. And then how to describe the transition. Activation is when you go from closed to open. Inactivation is when you go from closed to inactivated state. And then the channel needs to recover from inactivation. All right, so let's keep going. We've got a few brain teasers today. Uh, I'll get your, we'll use our top hats in just a second. So make sure you have those devices close close by. If you need some text uh, to what I was just saying, you can actually read this at home. This is actually talking about activation, the activation gate, and inactivation. Now, one other term that we haven't talked about is under physiological conditions. This doesn't happen normally. 
You can hyperpolarize the cell so quickly, again, in the laboratory, you can force the cell from the open state directly back to the closed state. And that's called deactivation. Okay, and that's written right here. It's actually right here. It talks a little bit about deactivation as well. Okay, channels transitioning from the open to the closed state undergo a process called deactivation. That doesn't normally occur. Again, you can force it to happen in the laboratory just by hyperpolarizing quickly. All right, so um, let me just say, let me go back and just make sure that we understand uh, where we're going. We've already talked about conductance. We talked about gating. And now we're going to start with selectivity. And I showed you this particular video last time of the students, one student letting one student in, but the other one couldn't enter. And that was just a funny example of selectivity. So that's where we're going to start, OK? How do we think about selectivity for electrolytes? All right, there are some characteristics of the molecules that pass through ion channels um, that we're gonna go over. So how do you let some ions in and across the plasma membrane, in that channel and across the plasma membrane? And how do you keep some ions out? How do you let some of them in but keep others out? Okay, so that's what selectivity is. Well, size, right? The size of the molecule is important, okay? So you can imagine if the pore region of a channel is very small, it's only going to let smaller ions in, and it's going to keep larger ions out. Okay, so that's one. That's, that's intuitive. That's not too hard. All right, the other is interaction of charges within the pore. That's the second one here. Interaction of charges within the pore. You can actually see this is a cross section of an ion channel. This is an anion channel. And what you'll notice with anion channels is there are these positive amino acids, these positive residues that actually line the interior of the pore region. And it attracts negative ions like chloride and bicarbonate, but it repels other cations. So charge is important, and, it, and the interaction of charges within the pore. Okay, That's not too difficult either. However, the ease of dehydration is interesting. Okay, So some students may not realize that you actually have to rip off water molecules in order to allow for some of these ions to move across the pore. So let's see if I can get this video up and running. Oh, by the way, I actually um, want to answer a question from last time, too. Uh, I'll do that in just a second. Okay. All right. Oh, also, I did have a question right before class. All of the past videos have been uh, put on our website now. So this weekend, you should be able to access every single lecture that we've had thus far. All right. Sodium chloride crystals are held together by attractive forces between the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ions. When a crystal of sodium chloride is placed into water, the hydrogen ends of polar water molecules attract the negatively charged chloride ions and gradually surround them. Likewise, the oxygen ends of water molecules are attracted to and surround the positively charged sodium ions. The hydrated ions drift away into the solution allowing new water molecules to surround newly exposed ions. All right, does that make sense, everyone? So when sodium chloride actually dissolves, dissociates within the solution, water molecules surround it, OK? So for sodium, it's the oxygen. Remember, water is like a polar molecule. So it's the oxygen with the negative charge is going to surround sodium, and it's the hydrogen on the other side that's going to surround chloride. 
All right, so what has to happen for an ion to actually move through the pore is basically it has to rip off those water molecules first, and then the ion can actually move through the pore. All right, so that's called dehydration. Now, let's do a little brain teaser here. You can talk to your neighbors when I ask the question. I'm going to pull it up here. All right, which ion is smaller? Now, this will have to take you back to chemistry, looking at the periodic table, if you can remember. Talk to your neighbor if you can't remember. That's perfectly fine. Remember, you don't have to. This is just a discussion. What, which one do you think is the smaller ion? Which ion actually has the smaller radius? Smaller ion. Anybody want to take a guess? Yes. Is it sodium? It is sodium. Sodium is smaller than potassium. All right, so that brings us to the second question here. Okay, so here's the answer. Sodium actually has a radius of only 0.95 angstroms, and potassium has a radius of 1.33 angstroms. So sodium is the smaller ion. So there are in existence highly selective potassium channels, right? How is that possible? How can an ion channel be highly selective for potassium? Okay, because sodium's the smaller ion. They both have the same charge. How is it possible, basically, that we have these highly selective potassium channels that repel sodium? So I'll let you talk about that in just a second. Give you a couple minutes to maybe come up with some ideas. Does someone want to take a guess? An educated guess? What do you think? What could it be? What do you think? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yes. So I kind of led you into that, but yes, you're exactly right. It's the ease of dehydration, but let me just show you how elegant this is. Now, sodium is the smaller ion, but it hangs on to that water molecule a little bit tighter than potassium. All right. However, this is the cool part. The pore region of the potassium channel exactly mimics the water molecules that surround it. So I'll say that again. The interior, that's this upper part here, see where my arrow is? The interior of the pore region of the potassium channel exactly mimics, now we're going down here, the water molecules that surround potassium, okay? So these are the amino acids that have these carbonyl groups attached to them, right? They actually are mimicking these, these are the water molecules that surround potassium. So what happens is potassium actually slides right out of those water molecules and right into the pore. Hardly any energy has to be injected into the system. 
So the fixed filter structure is finely tuned to accommodate potassium, but not sodium. So you can see sodium is the smaller ion, but it can't shrink enough the, the pore region to accommodate sodium. You would actually have to inject energy into it to make the pore region actually smaller. And therefore, the energetic cost for dehydration is higher for sodium. It's exactly why selectivity is achieved with those potassium channels. Right? So it's the distance really between these oxygen right, and the potassium molecule. Again, it's exactly fine-tuned, the pore region, so that it mimics those water molecules. And it just slides from the water molecules right into the pore. Okay, so ease of dehydration is really important. It's really, I would just want to impress upon you that this is really a beautifully elegant system. Okay? All right, so this is just fun. Humans have found a similar solution to a similar problem. The problem is passing big feet and blocking small feet. And the solution, has anyone ever seen these cattle grids, these beautiful cattle grids in Europe, right? So the problem here, I guess the analogy is the, the cattle, their feet represent the sodium ion. They're much smaller. And our big feet actually represent the potassium. These cattle grids will allow for humans to walk across, but not the cattle. You can actually see he's kind of stuck there, right? So again, selectivity has been achieved. I, in, the, <laughs> in the last class, I, I, I had some questions like, how does the cattle know that they can't cross, right? Um, have, if, if you have a dog too, um, they just, it's not that there was, that it had to learn the hard way. It's just that like when dogs look down on a bridge that's wooden, they kind of see the, the bottom and they're automatically like, no way, I'm not crossing that. So it's kind of the same thing. The cattle kind of look down all the way down and they just know, okay, this isn't for me. Okay, so that's how selectivity is achieved. And there's some beautiful cattle grids in beautiful areas, Scotland and around the UK. So I just want to ask. I don't know how to think about this. I just thought it was cute. <laughs> the little dogs jumping over. Um, yes, question. My dog does that with steer grains all the time. He walks really far away from me. Yeah, right, right, exactly. They just kind of instinctively know not to go near those grids. So that's how that works. Um, what's that? It works for bears, too. Bears, uh, too. Wild, park, and that's how we would, because like, you could drive through it, and that's how we'd stop them from going into like, the other parts that have other animals. Like oh, them. wow, I didn't know that. Bear grids. <laughs> I had no idea. All right. Um, okay, I did have a question last time. I wanted to make sure that I addressed it too now that I'm thinking about it. Otherwise, I'll forget. Uh, we had somebody ask about kinases, phosphorylation gated channels. Do you remember that question? Phosphorylation gated channels. And they said, wouldn't you have to use energy? The kinase actually uses ATP. I don't know what I was thinking, but that was absolutely right. Thank you for that. But remember, this is still considered facilitated diffusion, so don't get this confused. Yes, energy has to be used to open up the channel, but with facilitated diffusion, the molecules are still going to proceed from high concentration to low concentration. You would need additional energy if you were going to move them in the opposite direction. Is that good? Did I confuse you? Or Okay, great. Good. I so, all right. So I wanted to make sure I wanted to say thank you for that question. All right. So let's keep going. There's a few other. These are some brain teasers. Today's just some, a few games during the lecture. Um, all right. So two terms that I also need you to know for the exam. Depolarization and hyperpolarization. I mentioned it before, but now I am formally actually going to tell you the terms because we're talking about ion channels, all right? So in this case, you can see on the left-hand side, it's pertaining to sodium channels. If the concentration gradient and the electrical force are, so, are such, when you open up a sodium channel, and this is what usually happens because the resting membrane potential is pretty uh, negative, you'll see that sodium channels will rush into the cell, right? 
and that will tend to make the cell more positive, pulling the resting membrane potential towards the equilibrium potential for sodium. Anytime you move the membrane potential in a positive direction, that's called depolarization. So instead of me saying, okay, I'm going to move the membrane potential in a more positive direction, because that's what I've been doing, I'm going to say the cell was depolarized. Right? I depolarized the cell. Automatically, you should think, okay, now we've made the inside of the cell more positive, right, in that inner leaflet. All right, hyperpolarization is the opposite. In this case, if the cell is at rest and we open up an additional amount of uh, additional population of potassium channels, potassium is going to leave the cell, and that tends to hyperpolarize the cell, moving it closer to the equilibrium potential for potassium. So anytime you move the membrane potential in a more negative direction, you can say hyperpolarization. The cell was hyperpolarized. Okay, so I just want to make sure I formally roll that out. All right, so take a look at the middle panel. What's wrong with this picture? I found this in a textbook. What's wrong with this picture? Take a look at the cell and the graph at the bottom, the middle panel. What do you think? You want to take a guess? If there's no ions moving across the membrane, what should the membrane voltage be? What's that? Uh, no, the, with the um, leak potassium channels, they're actually setting the resting membrane potential about negative 80, but potassium's leaving in that case and it's pulling it close to the equilibrium potential. But if there's no ions moving across the membrane, what should that be? Zero. Okay, so the graph at the bottom should be zero. If you remember our computer simulation before I opened that channel, the membrane voltage was zero. And then once I opened the channel, you remember the computer simulation, it actually started to teeter-totter and it, then it started to pull the membrane voltage to minus 60. All right, so let's just uh, talk a little bit about the big super family of voltage-gated ion channels. Please don't memorize this for the exam. This is just kind of a fun slide. You can even write that on the slide. This isn't, this is too much information, all right? But I just want to show you where we're going. These are giving you the names of our different voltage-gated uh, channels. This one right here is called a K2P or K2 pore. These are our leak potassium channels. They're always open. These leak channels are setting the resting membrane potential for just about every cell in your body. Again, they don't really get the respect that they deserve, but they are very important. All right, so you have other voltage-gated potassium channels. They're very small um, channels. They come together, to, uh, four of them, the subunits come together to form a pore region. Here's our sodium and calcium channels right here in blue. They are very large. It's kind of like all four of those subunits are hooked with uh, intermembrane sequences. Okay, so it's a very large channel. All right, uh, these are the KIRs in uh, inwardly rectifying. They're very important in setting the resting membrane potential in heart cells, heart. And speaking of the heart, this one is called hyperpolarization cyclic nucleotide channels. These are setting the pacing of your heart. These are responsible for the spontaneous depolarization that make your heart beat, right? It's responsible for cardiac pacing. Now this is the thing that's funny to me. These HCN channels are literally called funny channels. Funny channels. 
They're responsible for the funny current and they're in your pacemaker cells in your heart. Okay, we'll learn all about that when we get to the heart, which is pretty cool. But don't worry about them right now, but they're called funny channel. They, you can look it up, they're called funny channels. All right, so these are kind of fun, these trip uh, channels here. These trip channels, um, I'm gonna tell you about trip V right here first. Uh, trip V is, the V stands for vanilloid, and they are in your mouth. They are temperature sensitive. So when you drink coffee or tea, it actually opens up with hot temperature, okay? Uh, when you eat a chili pepper, you always notice that your mouth feels hot, right? Because it's actually activating the same trip V receptor. So when you eat chili peppers, it's just like drinking hot coffee. It feels hot in your mouth. All right, the other one here is trip uh, M right here, trip M. These are also temperature sensitive, but they detect cold temperatures. So if you've ever noticed when you eat a menthol, your mouth feels cold, it's actually again activating those same receptors, those same channels. Trip M. So those are kind of fun to know. Um, all right, so let's keep going. We're still with facilitated diffusion. I just want to briefly talk about permeases for a minute. These are also called carriers, permeases or carriers. And they work this way. This blue side is the extracellular side. This brown side at the top is the intracellular side. So basically what's happening is you have this solute that's acting as a ligand. It binds to its binding site right here. There's a conformational change and then basically the affinity for that solute lowers and then the solute is released on the other side. A perfect example of these permeases or carriers is a glucose transporter. And we'll learn about that when we talk about GI, your small intestines. Glucose binds on one side and then it's delivered to the other side of the membrane. The classic type is called SGLT1, which is a sodium glucose transport. Pretty easy. All right, so let's go to active transport. We finish, finish. All right, how are we doing? Okay, we're doing good. All right, so. Um, let's see here. All right. So we're going to go through active transport now. And we're going to have you get your top hat questions out or your devices out. Uh, again, if you want to take a look at the learning objectives, they are listed. Just blow this up a little bit. All right. And you can take a look at this at home. I think it'll make more sense after the lecture, so I'm not gonna read through them now. So remember with active transport here, this is the same slide that I just showed you. You do need to inject energy into the system with an active transporter. It uses, it harnesses that energy, and it moves molecule against their concentration gradient. So this little triangle on the far right side here is telling you something about the concentration gradient. It's high on the outside relative to the inside. And you can see this active transporter is moving solutes against their concentration gradient. Okay. And again, solutes move in both directions. Well, no, they don't actually. Um, with passive diffusion, they do. And then you have to take into account the net diffusion. But with active transport, again, they're moving opposite to the direction predicted by the concentration gradient. Okay, so if you were filling out that chart that I kind of start, had you start last time, just remember with active transport, a protein transported, transporter is needed, energy is required, and molecules can move from low to high. So let's take a look at the two types of active transport. 
The two main types are primary active transport and secondary active transport. So with primary active transport, it actually harnesses the energy from the hydrolysis of ATP. So when ATP is broken down into ADP and an inorganic phosphate group, then basically it gives off energy. It's an exergonic reaction. Okay, and these uh, transporters harness that energy and they move molecules from low to high. Secondary active transport actually uses the movement of one ion. Most of the time it's sodium. It uses the sodium gradient to move molecules against their concentration gradient. So it couples the movement of one molecule to the movement of a second molecule. That's secondary active transport. So let's start right now with primary active transport. Let's go back and just concentrate on that primary active transport. Remember that it's all about the hydrolysis of ATP, which provides the energy. There are three types. P type, which means phosphorylation type. F and V type, that's factor and vesicle type. Those actually pump protons. And ABC type, that's ATP binding cassette. So it binds ATP. And it moves very large organic molecules, a lot of times toxins and drugs. So we'll go through each of these different types. Let's start with phosphorylation type, P type. Basically, with phosphorylation type, it transports proteins. The, the transport protein is phosphorylated at an aspartic acid residue. It can transport sodium, potassium, protons, and calcium. And the classic example is the pump, sodium potassium ATPase. So we've already discussed the pump. This is basically the engine of every cell. If the pump isn't working, then the cell has died. All right, so it is a very important transporter. It is setting up the potassium gradient and the sodium gradient. We've talked about that already. So here's how it works. Let's go through this figure. I'm gonna blow this up a bit so that everybody can see it a little bit better, right? All right, so what you have here, we're gonna look at the first panel the blue side is the extracellular fluid, and the top part, the brown, is the intracellular fluid, okay? So remember, with every turn of the pump, the pump removes three sodium out of the cell and brings in two potassium into the cell. That's what's establishing that, those gradients. High sodium on the outside, low sodium on the inside, high potassium on the inside, low potassium on the outside. So how does it work? Uh, first of all, ATP binds to the transporter. And now at this point in, in this confirmation, the transporter has a high affinity for sodium. So sodium binds to the transporter from the inside, binds to the transporter, and then there's this hydrolysis of the ATP. The phosphate group actually stays attached to the transporter and ADP is released. And then you can actually see there's a conformational change. When that happens, that conformational change, it lowers the affinity for sodium and sodium is delivered to the outside of the cell. Okay? Then in this conformation, the the binding sites for potassium now have a very high affinity. Potassium binds to the transporter. That phosphate group is released. There's a conformational change. Then the uh, binding sites for potassium that lowers, the affinity is lowered, and then potassium is delivered to the inside of the cell. Okay, so this is in your textbook if you want to review it again but these are the sequence of events that occurs. All right, so 
There is, you know, I like to kind of give you a heads up, but one's going to be on the exam. This is one of the ones that I just really want you to get right. If you see something that looks like this, this is the pump, the sodium potassium ATPase. I do want you to be able to label it, something like this, okay? Remember, three sodium out, two potassium in. It hydrolyzes A. TP, ADP is released, and a phosphate group is attached. Okay, so just a heads up. Make sure you understand that process. All right, so here's the definition of chemical steady state. It's a condition where bulk ion concentrations within the cell remain constant over time. So remember the resting membrane potential isn't at the equilibrium potential so you know there's net movement of sodium and potassium sodium will continue to move into the cell through its channels potassium will move out now if you didn't have the pump eventually it would run down so the pump is here to re-establish those gradients there has to be some mechanism to maintain the chemical gradients for these two ions, and it is the pump. It provides the potential energy. When it establishes that sodium gradient, that's potential energy, okay? All right, so let me just talk a little bit more about the pump. Um, anybody know who Rodney Dangerfield is? I, I used to say this, everybody used to know who he was. Now no one knows who he is. Anybody watch Caddyshack? Yes, all right. Caddyshack, anybody? Caddyshack? All right, so, uh, he's a comedian who used to, his shtick was actually, I get no respect. I get no respect. I always think about the pump as the transporter that gets no respect. People don't really understand how important this transporter is, all right? so. I want you to know that it does contribute to the resting membrane potential, but it's relatively small, ranging only from a few millivolts to about 20 millivolts. Okay, so it doesn't really contribute too much. But I want you to understand this. When you think of all the ATP that's produced by the mitochondria, remember oxidative phosphorylation? 40% of that ATP goes to running this pump. That's a lot. So you know this pump is important. 40% of the ATP produced in that cell is going to run this pump. Okay? All right, so let's think about some things. Let's get our top hat devices out. Okay. We're going to do a few um, brain teasers. You guys can talk to your neighbors. But this is going to show you how important the pump really is. So I'm going to draw. Magna, do you actually have a, I think I have a, a blank piece of paper. Oh. Um, or I have a blank piece of paper. Do you have a pen? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. I'm going to draw it here, too. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Sweet. All right. So the first question for today, and I'll, I'll uh, open up the question. I'll tell you what the question is, but I'm going to draw it too so that you can really understand what I'm asking. Let me just switch over to your class. All right. So here's the question, the first question. All right, so the question is, if we block the sodium potassium ATPase or the pump with a drug called Wabane, Wabane is an inhibitor of the pump. It's a, used as a cardiac glycoside to help with different uh, arrhythmias and conditions of the heart. Um, what will happen to membrane voltage? So before we do that, let me just draw this. I'll come back to this. I'll open it back up. I'm going to draw a cell here. 
And maybe you want to draw it as well. It may help you think about it. It's kind of a little bit of a brain teaser. Whoa, where are we? Here we go. Ugh. All right, here's our cell. Okay. So remember, for every turn of the pump, you're removing three sodium. Can you see that all right? Okay. And you're bringing in two potassium for every turn of the pump. So now think about that. For every turn of the pump, this is called an electrogenic event. Electrogenic because one net ion is being removed. One net positive is constantly being removed. So if we block this with wobbing, how is that going to affect membrane voltage? All right, how is that going to affect membrane voltage? All right, so I'll let you answer. Is the membrane voltage going to become more depolarized? Is it going to be depolarized, I should say? Is it going to stay the same? Or is the cell going to hyperpolarize? Now you know those terms. You can talk to your neighbor. What's going to happen if you block the pump? All right, we have 81, 82 people that have answered. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. All right, does anyone need any more time in this room? Raise your hand high if you need a few more minutes or a few more seconds. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this. And the correct response is A. All right, that's a hard one. Let's go back to our document camera. Most of you got that right, so kudos. But let's see what we're dealing with here. All right. Normally, when the pump is working properly, it will remove one positive ion, right? If it stops, then you're going to get an accumulation of sodium inside, and it's actually going to depolarize the cell. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, so the next one. Let's go to the next one here. Obviously, the pump is important. It has some effect on membrane voltage. What about this one? If we use the same drug, what's going to happen to cell volume? Now I won't lead you on this one. What's going to happen to cell volume? Is the cell going to shrink? Is it going to stay the same? Or is it going to swell? All right, so we're already up to 84. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Anybody need a little more time in this room? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this. And the correct response is 
going to swell. All right. So let's take a look at what hap what's happening here. All right, let's draw another cell. I think I might have a better pen. Maybe, maybe not. No. <laughs> oh, a little bit better. All right. So here's our pump. Three sodium out, two potassium in for every turn of the pump, right? What's happening is you can think about it this way. With every turn of the pump, you're removing one osmolite. Does that make sense? With every turn of the pump, you're removing one osmolite. If you block it, you're going to start to accumulate osmolites. And what's going to happen? It's going to lower the water molecule concentration and water is going to move into the cell and it will swell. Does that make sense? You're going to accumulate osmolites and water will move into the cell and swell. Now, just so you know, if you add Wabane in the laboratory to cells, what does it do? It depolarizes the cell and it makes them swell. You can actually see that in the laboratory. That actually happens. Okay? All right, any questions so far? Now I have to give you one. This is a real brain teaser. This actually requires two different transporters. Okay. Here's the cell. Remember our pump, sodium, three sodium out, two potassium in. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you about a secondary active transporter. A lot of times primary active transporters and secondary active transporters are coupled. All right, so here is a really cool transporter called an exchanger. It uses the sodium gradient to remove protons from the cell. It uses the sodium gradient to remove protons, hydrogen ions, from the cell. Okay? So what happens if you use Wabane? What happens to the pH within the cell? That's the next question. You can write that down. If we block the cell with Wabane, what will happen to the pH in the intracellular compartment? Talk to your neighbor. This is like a two-step process. Is it going to become more acidic? Is it going to stay the same? Or is it going to become more alkaline? Is the pH going to rise? I would, I would actually draw the cell, draw those two transporters, then it's easier to see. All right, we've got about 74 students that have answered. I'll give you about 10 more seconds here. All right. Anybody need a little more time in this room? <laughs> All right. OK. So go ahead and close it. And the correct response is A. Ah, OK. All right. Good job if you got that right. If not, let's go through it. Let's talk about this for a minute. All right. What's going to happen to the concentration gradient if you block the pump with Wabane. 
What's going to happen to the concentration gradient? Well, sodium is going to fall on the outside, right? That's going to reduce the energy. You're not going to be able to have, right? Sodium's going to fall. You're not going to have as much energy from the sodium gradient to remove protons from the cell. So you're going to accumulate protons in the cell, and it's going to acidify. Okay? So really think about that this weekend. There is a question pertaining to uh, intracellular pH on your exam. Uh, if you're still confused, I will stay after. Remember, I'm going to be here for a little bit. Uh, we'll roll out cystic fibrosis on Monday. Okay. All right? All right. Have a great weekend, everyone. And we'll give you your cystic fibrosis um, uh, case study on Monday. Have a good weekend. Can I give you the part to or should I email it? You can email me a picture if that's cool. Okay. All right.